So this week I was uh, listening to a, a podcast from a ministry and uh, they were talking at the very beginning about some of the strife among relationships during this quarantine. And they ran across an article that described arguments that families had had since they'd gotten into quarantine. I don't know if you've had any good arguments with your family since you got into quarantine, but the longer that we're all locked down with each other, the crazy the arguments get. And they had had people send in some of the arguments they'd had, and uh, they were just reading back some of the different debates they'd had. One guy said that uh, he and his wife argued for an hour about whether or not the stray cat in the neighborhood had a tail. Like that was the big debate. Uh, another woman said that her husband went to take a bath and came out to tell her that he had purchased a $400 telescope on Amazon. Apparently, uh, boredom leads to shopping. Uh, one uh, woman said that she discovered she hates the way her husband approaches a jigsaw puzzle. You can develop these real passionate thoughts when you're locked in with one another. Uh, another guy complained that his wife continually brought him coffee in the mug that he hates, and that had caused them to fight. Uh, but the host of the show, it was kind of funny, she said later on, she said, you know, we got into a fight. Um, my husband and I had a fight over eschatology, over the study of the end times. Okay. And uh, she said, they've been married for 10 years. And it grew so heated that at one point she blurted out, I don't know if I can be married to somebody who believes that. And they were laughing about it on the, on the podcast. Uh, but the whole time I was thinking, how do you get to be married 10 years and not have those kind of conversations? Like, at what point do you not talk that? Now I realize that maybe our kitchen conversation is a little bit abnormal, but it was hard for me to understand how you could get 10 years into a marriage and not talk about those things. And the hosts were laughing about it, saying, who cares if we see these things differently? And I'm certainly not advocating ending a marriage over eschatology, but I'm here to tell you those things really do matter. What we believe about the end of the age, what we think about end times, really do matter. Good, godly people do see it differently, but how we see it informs how we live our lives. And there's an idea that studying the end of the age or end times is kind of a waste of time, and it's an ancillary topic, and it doesn't really matter, and it's, dis it's kind of a waste of time to talk about. And there's a disdain that is expressed this way. People say things like, I'm really not an end times person. I'm more of a great commission person. I am more of a let's get it done now. Let's do the job in front of us. And we'll let God sort it all out. We have an assignment to do. And I'm just here to tell you that's intellectually dishonest. I'm a great commission guy. I'm all about justice. I'm all about salvation. I'm all about wanting the fullness of what God wants to do in our lives now. But I'm also an end times guy. I have a job to do here on earth. The Lord has called me to do certain things, called me to parent, called me to be a husband, called me to lead people. But thinking about the end game doesn't mean I don't trust God. It just means that my job here matters. In fact, because there's an end game, my job here matters more than it was if I didn't think about it. And I was thinking about, you know, Emily and David this morning with that baby. Every diaper you change matters now, not just in, uh, in the sense of smell. But every diaper you change now actually matters in eternity. You're doing things in this life that matter. And there's a sense among the church that because God has a plan, that the study of that plan is kind of useless. But I don't study or teach of it because of the lack of his plan, but because actually his plan is beautiful. And I believe that looking at the return of the Lord fits hand in glove with the Great Commission. To be drawn to preach the gospel so that others come to know Jesus only makes understand only has understanding with the realization that he's actually coming back. Short of the great return of Christ, does the Great Commission even matter? Where's the urgency? We are creating disciples, not just for this life, but for all of eternity. Everything that we do matters forever. We have, you know, set our life a little bit on edge by uh, adding a lot of children to our home. Why did we do that? Just to be nice. I'm frankly, I'm not that nice. Uh, just to give kids a home. Well, yes, kids need, need a home, but we did that to change the trajectory of their life forever. So uh, this gathering started, if you're new to us, you, we started uh, with a 40-day fast that led up to Easter. Then it kind of continued because we, we ended up in a pandemic and uh, we were all locked in our house and this was the best way to do it. 
and we're, we're leading up to Pentecost Sunday. And in this season, we've talked about kind of the church calendar or the, the calendar of God is a better way to say it. And this past Thursday on the calendar of history or the calendar of God would have marked the ascension or Jesus returning to the Father after his resurrection. We've got multiple references to it in the New Testament, but there's really kind of one story of record that we presume was written by Luke, uh, although we don't really know for sure. We really are not totally sure who wrote the book of Acts, but that's the most scholars' feeling. So I want to start by reading the first 11 verses, and we will go back and reference these again during the course of our morning. But uh, if you have your Bibles, look at Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, that's why we think Luke wrote it, because Luke references Theophilus in his book as well. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go to heaven. So let me just really quickly put this on the timeline of God. And, and I don't want to ever assume that people have a full grip on this. So just really quickly, Jesus is born and he spends 30 years in relative obscurity. We don't know much about what happened to him during those 30 years. We knew he grew in stature with God and man. And we knew that at one point on a road trip, he snuck away from his parents. That's about all we know from the first 30 years of Jesus's life. Next came three years of ministry during which he challenged both the religious leaders and the Roman occupying force until he was publicly killed and placed in a tomb. Almost everything that you know about Jesus is based on those three years. If you're 20 years old or you're 70 years old, can you imagine almost everything anybody knowing about you based on three years? Those three years were an intense season of ministry. He is killed by the Romans, then he is raised from the dead, and he spends 40 days revealing himself with his followers. He didn't make secret backstage appearances. It was very public. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. All of this passage leads to Acts, where he ascends to be with the Father, and in those 11 verses, a lot of things happen. He is speaking about the extension of his kingdom, and in light of the fact that he is talking to them about the extension of his kingdom, his departure seems like a really strange move. From a, uh, from a let's overthrow the government and set up a kingdom perspective, leaving seemed like a strange choice. So let's look at a, a kind of three different pieces there. First of all, he commissions, commissions them before his departure. He makes it really clear that there is a season of history during which he will entrust the growth of his kingdom to this little ragtag bunch of followers. Jesus is giving over his life mission to them. So those of you that have, have surrendered responsibility for things, you understand it is work. It takes great effort to turn over authority from one thing to the other. It's a little bit like riding a unicycle. It's easier just to keep going. And yet he hands it over to these other leaders, and he does it in three parts. He sets these leaders in place. As part of his great commission, he provides a structure of leadership. Now, the church over history has kind of swung back and forth about how it feels about church leadership. I have seen signs on churches on the front that say, Jesus is our senior pastor. And uh, I love that sentiment, but almost always those churches are not very big. Because what they're really saying is, we don't want any human leaders. We're going to make Jesus the senior pastor, but anarchy doesn't really support a very large group very well. 
Other churches go the other direction, and they equate the man or the woman leading almost as God himself. And we may have got it wrong at times, but Jesus does put human leaders in place with real structure. And uh, he does this because commissions, even great commissions, short of structure, rarely turn to accomplishments. They're a little bit like what I said about goals without tactics last week. They're really just wishes. So he sets these guys in place, these church leaders with authority, sets them with authority saying, these apostles whom I have chosen, he singles them out as being the ones he wants to lead the church. He gives them authority and he also gives them insight. He says that they, he had given them commands through the Holy Spirit. So these leaders maybe didn't know it all. In fact, in the greater scheme of, of theology, because you've got the benefit of having the full New Testament, you may have a better developed theology than these apostles did at this point. But they did have some bit of understanding. Leaders have got to have a sense of a calling, and they've got to have a clue. They don't have to know it all, but they've got to have some understanding of where things are going. So he sets these leaders in place, and in this season, he also provides a proof of life as a way of commissioning them before his departure. Acts says he presented to them himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. He went to great lengths so they understood that he was alive, and he does it on a grand scale. If you read through it quickly, you don't really understand how many people he, he appeared to. But 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 7, Paul tells us that he appeared to Cephas, or to Peter, and then to the 12, and that's what we kind of think of as happening during that season. But Paul goes on to tell us, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom still alive, although some have fallen asleep. He said he, he reached, he was appeared to by 500 men, which means, including women and children, could have been 1,500 people who saw a resurrected Jesus between the time he left the grave and returned to his father. Say, so why is that important? It's because Jesus went to great lengths to prove to his people he was alive. He was not upset by their questions. He was not uh, insulted by what they wondered. He loves to show himself to people who wonder what he is up to. So he sets leaders in place. He provides proof of life. And then he lays out a promise that will only come if they wait. He, he, he writes, um, if you've ever uh, put rules in your email so that certain things happen, this is an if-then rule. And he writes an if-then rule. If you do this, then will happen. This thing will happen. Now, it's easy to think of these disciples as kind of frightened young men, but we know enough about them to think formulating their neck well. Even while he was in his ministry phase, they were negotiating for position. And so now that he's getting ready to depart, it's easy to imagine these kind of Machiavellian instincts kind of kick in. And they're thinking, well, if Jesus is going to go, somebody's going to have to lead. And, oh, this might be my opportunity. So he writes this if-then rule in regards to their mission. He says, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise from the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or seasons, for the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. This is the if-then. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. You can almost hear the disciples go, oh, that's good. That's good. We're going to receive power. And they're talking amongst themselves. What is he talking about? We don't know. But this is good. If we wait, we'll receive this. Now, there's a fair amount of confusion in the church even today around this promise of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit in a separate context. And the confusion continues today as uh, we kind of divide ourselves into maybe charismatic churches and non-charismatic churches. And we use phrases like spirit-filled almost as if to insinuate those that don't uh, manifest the gifts of the Spirit in a certain way don't have a measure of the Holy Spirit. And that's not true. Jesus taught in John 14, 16, and 17. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, get this, for he dwells within you and will be in you. 
When you came to Jesus, the Holy Spirit came into your life. He resides in you. And in that respect, all believers are spirit-filled. John 14 says he will be in you and with you for your inward life, for your own encouragement, for your peace. He will bring conviction. All believers encounter the Holy Spirit that way. But in Acts 1, he uses slightly different language. John 14, he says he will be in you and with you. In Acts 1, he says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That was a different thing. That references many times in the Old Testament when it talks about him coming upon people for battle. He came upon craftsmen that they would be able to accomplish their craft. He came upon people in wisdom. It's the very same Holy Spirit operating in different functions. When you become a believer, he, comes, he is in you, but there is also a season when he comes upon you for ministry. You say, well, which one of those do we need? We need them both. We need the John 14 experience to walk through life and to grow in Christ to be a good spouse, to be a good father, to be a good employee, to be discipled. We need all those things. We need him living in us. We also need the experience that Jesus promised in Acts to fulfill the Great Commission, to share the gospel, and declare the rule of God, and further the awareness of the kingdom on the earth. One expression, the Holy Spirit in you, gives you peace and comfort. The other one makes you a supernatural force. And when you have the spirit of the peace of God in you through his spirit, combined with the Holy Spirit on you in the way of ministry, you're now in a position to accomplish and see really great things. So he commissions them with authority, with the proof of life, and with a promise before his departure. Does all these things. But even his departure sends a signal. Now this may sound counterintuitive. How does leaving send a sign to any of them? This is what his departure signals. His departure signals his return. Most people look at the idea of the ascension, and they look at that as his departure saying, okay, go ahead and get to work. I have turned it over to you. Go do what you need to do. And I've even heard pastors talk about the idea of Jesus looking over the balcony of heaven at human beings carrying out the Great Commission, and angels asking Jesus, what if they fail? And Jesus shakes his head and says, I have no other plan. And that could have been their mindset, that Jesus is like up in heaven wringing his hands. I have no other plan. Now that Christ has returned to the Father, it's all up to us. We've got to go conquer the world for him. But they don't think much about the real message of his ascension. Yes, he commissioned them to accomplish the Great Commission, but he also promised this baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the real message is, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. Looking back at Acts 1, the passage we read earlier. Verses 9 through 11. When he has said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took them out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. These are angels. And they said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The last heavenly message of Jesus' ascension, not from Jesus, but from angels, was that he is coming back the same way that he left in the clouds. This wasn't a throwaway line by the angels. It wasn't like the angels looked at him and said, boy, they're depressed. We got to tell them something to encourage him. He wasn't just throwing a line to them. They were giving them information that we didn't have access to. 60 years later, when John the Revelator is an old man on the Isle of Patmos, he has a vision and he records in Revelation 1-7 the same detail. He says, behold, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. You can almost hear John as he gets this vision. He goes, I've heard this before. Like this has been, oh, oh, the angels told us this. When he went up into heaven, they said he is returning on the clouds. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if Jesus had not ascended? Ever think about that? What if he just didn't go up? What if he rose from the dead, just took up housekeeping? He didn't do that. He left intentionally. And it's easy to imagine the disciples wondering, why did it have to go down this way? He just beat death. He could have run for any office and won. But Jesus knew there was a plan. And he had told him in John 17, 6, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage if I go away. 
For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus was saying, I'm returning to the Father so that human beings can understand what it is like when the Holy Spirit rests on them and they partner with my Father God. The empowering of the Holy Spirit made a radical change in his followers. Three years in the presence of Jesus, and they are still largely asking the wrong questions. They were relating to him as a physical man. Had he stayed, they would have continued to relate to him that way. He said, I've got to ascend to the Father so the Holy Spirit can come on you and you can understand fellowship with me in a way you never could in simply a physical way. Jesus ascended to the Father because in leaving the Holy Spirit to empower this ragtag bunch of people he entrusted with his message, he would realize the full glory that he was due. It actually makes for a better, more fantastic story that he allowed human beings to participate in the overthrow of evil than if God had done it alone by himself. Going to the Father and empowering disciples was the equivalent of Jesus batting left-handed, blindfolded with a wiffle ball bat and knocking the ball out of a major league ballpark. He said, I'm going to use these broken people, but I'm going to pour my spirit into them, and the enemy is going to see how powerful I am. Ephesians 4.10 says, he who descended is the one who also ascended, who also went up far above the heavens that he might fill all things. The, the NIV says, in order to fill the entire universe, that the glory of the Lord would fill the earth. He ascended so that he could use us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the, and the, the story would be so much greater. So his commission precedes his ascension. He commissions them, then he ascends. His ascension points to his return. He goes up to tell us he's coming down, and now it comes full circle because his return motivates our great commission. It's like a big circle. He commissions us. He goes up to show us he's coming back. And the fact that he's coming back motivates us to accomplish his great commission. We would like to believe that we are all the exact same people in all circumstances, that we never alter our behavior based on whether or not someone is coming into the room or not. But we do. Our children do that. How many of you have parents... You have left the room, and the only reason that your children respond in the way you want them to is because they know dad's coming back. And so I can't do certain things because dad's coming back. Part of their motivation was to respond in the way that we want them to involves the fact that mom and dad are coming back. That can be a negative or that can be a positive. The negative is the idea that if you're misbehaving when dad returns, it's going to be bad. That's not the motivation we're talking about here. The flip side of that is the knowledge that when the father returns, if he finds us doing what he told us to do, we will be rewarded. Now, I hope you don't take offense at this, but let's just be honest. We're all barely saved. I mean, barely. Are we fully saved? Yes, we're fully saved, but anybody who knows us knows it's a miracle. 1 Peter 4.18 says, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly or the sinner? First Peter just lays it out there. He says, even the people who are righteous, they're barely saved. Like, like they're fully saved, but it was a miracle that it happened. We tend to think, though, that once we get a foot in the door of the kingdom, everybody gets the same deal. And it's true of the way of salvation. If you've been saved a moment or you've been saved 80 years, it's the same. You're saved. But there are rewards in the life to come that will vary based on our obedience to the Lord in the life we are living. It took me a long time to get my head around this. Uh, not because I was a great theologian, but because I'm kind of American. And I like the idea of equality. And I don't like the idea that we may go to the next age and somebody may get something that I didn't. That doesn't seem fair to me. But as you study scripture, it actually seems scriptural. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay for up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be also. Too many of us live our lives with our hearts entirely in this life. 
and it's easily disguised as responsibility. It's easy to feel like I'm totally vested in investing here and to being responsible to those that I am responsible for. But there is something about laying up treasures in the life beyond that will pay a benefit. If Jesus didn't say we could put treasures in the life beyond and access those, then why, why did he encourage us to do it? Jesus made it clear that among those who love him, he rewards certain behavior, and that reward comes in the life to come. And now people will argue with that. They'll say, no, 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 no. Jesus loves everybody the same. Yes, he does. He loves all of us the same. But we do receive different levels of authority in the life to come based on our behavior and our obedience in this life. Do you love all your kids the same? Yes. Do you let your five-year-old drive the car? No. Why? Because they are not responsible. They have not shown themselves responsible. And even at five years old, there's not really anything they could have done to show themselves responsible. But over time, they grow and they receive of their privileges. And it's not a matter of love. It's just they can be entrusted with things that you couldn't have entrusted with them before. There are countless things in Scripture that the Bible says that Jesus or God rewards in the life to come. Things like a generous, uh, generous spirit. It's very clear in the Bible that those that are generous receive from the Lord. Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, I've heard that referencing giving, even monetarily giving, and I believe in it. I just don't believe it always comes back to you in this life. I just don't believe it because I know generous people who have struggled with poverty. But I also believe that the Lord rewards that generosity and one day they will receive far more than they've ever given back. No culture really admires uh, miserliness. In every culture, generosity is admired, but generosity only finds its full expression in faith. People can only really Afford to be generous when they understand there is a repayment somewhere and it is greater than any return they will get in this life. Luke 6.35 says, love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind and to the ungrateful and the evil. I really believe that that idea of response to our generosity doesn't just happen in this life. It happens beyond. In maintaining a generous spirit to those who don't deserve it, we reflect the nature of Jesus. And because we do that in, the, in the, the life beyond, he rewards us. Some of you have been generous in seasons that you never got to thank you for. And you know what? You may never. That person you were generous to may never see what you've done. And you may never receive financially back what you gave. We've all given things away and, it, and we just think it's gone. It's not gone. It's going to be repaid, but it's going to be repaid in the age to come in a way that would matter way more than anything that you could get today. Another thing that he rewards in the age to come is the idea of faithfulness in work. Work is a biblical concept. People not working is one of the most dangerous parts of this pandemic. I really believe it because of what it does to our mind. Work predates the curse. We've kind of made it a curse word. Yeah, I got to go to work. But Working is something that was a part of the kingdom and, and part of the garden long before the fall. It's that many of us are thinking of working in the wrong way or working for the wrong people. Not necessarily the wrong job, but with the wrong idea of who we're working for. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. We are serving the Lord Christ. The hours that you put in on your job and that you're responsible for and that you work hard on, even if they're never recognized by your immediate superior, they are recognized by the Lord. And when you go to your job with that idea that, yeah, that guy's paying me, but this one is rewarding me, it changes the way you think about work and it even changes what you're willing to do on the job. Mother Teresa's ministry carried for, uh, cared for kids in Calcutta for decades. And it instilled such a deep sense of serving Jesus that uh, serving even the children was a secondary task in the minds of the nuns. 
It was that real and that genuine and that poor. One reporter came to the ministry to write a feature article. And as he waited to meet with someone, he heard this awful noise just around the corner. And he got up and went to look. And as he really went around the corner, he realized it was a 10-year-old kid just being sick. And the kid was, was just making a mess, just throwing up there on the floor. And uh, he stepped back for a second. And immediately, one of the sisters took the boy off to clean him up. And another one of the sisters dropped to her knees and started cleaning up the mess on the tile and wiping it all up. And the, the reporter just muttered in honesty, you couldn't pay me enough to do that. And the nun responded in a second, yeah, you couldn't pay me enough to do this either. In other words, I'm not doing this for a paycheck. I'm doing this for my father. I'm not even doing this for the boy. I'm doing this unto the Lord. If you are working with eternity in mind, nothing is beneath you because it's all for the father. There are people in this pandemic who are going to be reassigned. Their jobs are going to be different than what they were because their jobs are gone. The only way they'll be able to step into their next assignment with dignity is if they realize we weren't doing it for a paycheck anyway. We are working under the Lord, and the Lord rewards that. Another thing he rewards in the next age, I really believe, is the idea of hospitality without any reservation. Luke 14, 13 and 14 says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Stop. That makes no sense. Like that equation makes no sense. How am I going to be blessed by the fact they can't repay you? Jesus goes on to say, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. There is a delayed payment for hospitality for those who cannot repay you. We were a part of a church in Cincinnati that used to throw what they call Matthew's parties. We would find an area of town where people had no resources. They were too far away from us to actually, uh, they wasn't going to build our church. And we would throw these massive parties and minister to these local areas because it built the church. No, actually it was a financial drain on the resources, but we did it with the idea that when we serve those who can't repay, Jesus repays. And scripturally, he says he repays at the end of the age. Jesus rewards things in this life and beyond. None of these passages where it talks about reward are talking about salvation, the greatest gift, the one that we all are able to receive. They're all talking about gifts at the end of the age or rewards that he gives us based on our behavior. There is always more going on, friends, than we see. Okay, always. There's always an angelic and a demonic realm. All of these things predated the existence of man. And one day we will fully understand those and we will be given authority in that realm that angels and demons have never received. And the amount of authority we are given in that realm will hinge on how we have been obedient in these areas of responsibility that Jesus laid out. Matthew 25, 23, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. That joy of our master is not this earth. Yes, there's rest in knowing Jesus. There's peace. There's joy. But he's talking about the end of the age there. So as he commissions them to accomplish the Great Commission, and he ascends to signal to them he is coming back, he also encourages us to set our sights on rewards for that day. This is an incredibly complex, beautiful passage that he involves us and promises us the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can accomplish the things he's, he sets us up for success by saying, I'm calling you to do something. I'm going to give you the power to do it. And when you do what I just gave you the power to do, I'm going to reward you for doing it. That's how much he loves us. I want to take a moment just to pray real quickly. We're going to open it up for questions, comments, anything anybody wants to share. Um, Let's pray. Father, thank you that your complex story that is so beautiful involves us. And you even set us up to accomplish the things that you asked us to do so that then you in turn could reward us. You are a better father than we even know. So as we lean into Pentecost Sunday that is coming, Lord, we ask, would you send your power? We wait. Would you give us your Holy Spirit in a measure that we have never known so that we can step into your purposes for our lives in a way that we never could?
in Jesus' name. Amen.